Hi, I'm Daryl Brown. Welcome to the season seven premiere of Shades of Us, a show that explores multicultural identities and how they intersect. We're here in Spanish Harlem, also known as the Barrio. This neighborhood located on the east side of Manhattan has one of the largest Hispanic communities in New York City. In this episode, we'll celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month and examine works being done by some Latinos to share their culture's history and bring awareness to their communities. Stay tuned for these stories right after this. According to a 2022 Pew Research Center survey, the Hispanic population made up nearly 20% of people in the United States. This number is up from 16% in 2010 and just 5% in 1970. Hispanics and Latinos are not a monolith, and studies devoted to these groups are crucial to understanding the complexities of all the cultures represented within. This is the mission of the Latin American and Latino Studies program at the City College of New York. We are all global, and America needs to start looking at immigrants and Latinos differently because our future depends on embracing our differences as a strength, not as a weakness. My name is Norma Fuentes Mayorga. I'm an associate professor at the Colin Powell School, Division of Social Sciences, professor in sociology and also an affiliate faculty in Latin American and Latino Studies. And I have been directing the program for the past three years, a Latin American and Latino Studies program. Right? and courses focused on Latin America and Latinos studies in the U.S. It's important, given the tremendous shift in the demographics of this country, we are the second largest group next to whites. We are the largest minority, ethnic minority. Believe it or not, most of my students don't know their own history. They don't know why they're categorized as Hispanics and why it's cooler to call yourself Latinx. We are Hispanic because this is a category used in the 1980s by the Bureau, by the people who categorize us, just to try to um, homogenize us, right? To make us all in one umbrella, an identity category, an umbrella. But the Hispanic label means just that you originate and are descendant of Spanish language and culture. But Spain conquered Latin America 500 years ago, right? And there are regions of Latin America, indigenous especially, in the Andes, that never adapted Spanish. They speak their own indigenous native languages. So we need better categories. The second category that evolved in the 90s is left mostly from academics and Latino politicians is the term Latino. Just to point our heritage from a larger continent right, of Latin America. My students, many of them, especially in the East Coast, don't know what Chicano category means. It means people that are autotonous from the Southwest that used to belong to Spain much before the Dutch came. Spain had conquered most of the Southwest, Arizona, California, Texas, San Diego, and the original autochthonous Native Americans were in those regions when Spain came and took over and imposed their culture and their religion on them. And then the English came and fought with Mexico and took over half of the Mexican territory in the mid-1880s. And then we started calling Mexicans foreigners. And we forgot also about the people that were there much before the Europeans came, which are the Chicanos. And I also tell my students that they are the global citizen, that City College has 165 different ethnic groups, according to Michelle Obama's convocation when she came to our commencement. And that means that at least half of them understand another culture, another language. What binds us is this history of migration and a history of living as colonized others uh, and mostly living as diasporic. I think if we treat all Hispanic as same, then we forget to see the different levels, as they say now, intersectional inequality levels that the group, the different groups 
um, experience, right? We have um, Latinos, like Dominicans, who compose the largest black Latino group in the United States. They experience, besides um, isolation and segregation, they experience racism. And they don't, they don't grow up with the same education that African Americans have grown up with this history of mobilizing around your identity and realizing that your grandparents were a slave. And yeah, Latin America discriminates and excludes its black and its indigenous, but does it very implicitly, very quietly. So I think lumping all Latinos and thinking that they're all undocumented or that they just all came from the boat or that they all have an accent, therefore they don't have education or that they're here to take jobs. Um, it's neglecting the United States. More than ever during Hispanic Heritage Month is when I am reminded that I am part of a growing majority. When I was at Princeton or I was at Columbia, I always felt something was missing. I didn't know what it was. I'm privileged, my God, to be there and I have an excellent education and mentors. But my soul was missing something. And when I came here, it wakes up. It makes me feel that I am part, that my education, when I've thought many times of quitting and leaving, because it's hard to work for a public university, my daughter, one of them, tells me, Mommy, it is a city college where they need you most and where you're gonna find the most gratification. And it's true, when I open my classroom and I see all the faces, I feel safe. I feel that this is the best. And so Hispanic Heritage is a, it's a special month for us to celebrate. We meet a Latina fashion designer in New York City's garment district, creating her unique line of sustainable women's wear clothing. Since I was little, I wanted to create. Fashion was the place where I found comfort and I wanted to navigate in what it meant to actually, you know, create and give that to other women. I'm Cindy Castro. I'm a proud Ecuadorian, a fashion designer, and the founder and the director of Cindy Castro New York. My business is located right in the heart of the garment district, right around all the fabric stores. This is an atelier mainly, meaning that we design, develop, and produce here, but we also have a small section that functions as a showroom. I was born and raised in Ecuador, and I left when I was about 18 years old. I am the first one of my family to be here. So when I came here, I did see myself being in a world of opportunities. I was an immigrant, so that is what made it hard. The burden of getting in debt to go to college is huge. I went to school in Chicago, Columbia College. I got my bachelor's of uh, fashion design. When I graduated, like no one told me that they were in like jobs in the creative area. You know, there were jobs in merchandising, in sales, you know, retail. Then people, you know, said like, oh no, for that you have to go to New York. And that summer we were visiting uh, an aunt and I started applying for internship. And I went to an interview th during my vacation. And when we were coming back home to Chicago, uh, they called me and they said, oh, Fashion Week is in a couple of weeks. We want you to start next Monday. So I'm, I'm married and it's just we're both creatives. So we said we have to move to a place where we can both grow. I didn't think I was going to have my own brand. I just wanted to work for other companies. So it was about a whole year that I did free internships because I didn't know anyone in the industry. I didn't have a community here in New York City. So it took me that long. And then after the year, I uh, landed my first job at Coach as an atelier assistant. And then I moved on to other companies as an assistant designer, um, associate designer, and designer. Cindy Castro New York was founded in 2020 as a result of the pandemic. Seeing how hurt the garment district was, it made me just shift my mindset into like, if I wanted to go back into fashion, I wanted to have a purpose. We are a sustainable, ethical women's clothing line. We are focused on 
garment uh, workers' rights, uh, manufacturing in New York City, and only working with natural fibers. My brand is committed from the fabrics. Uh, we only work with biodegradable fabrics. So all of our fabrics like cotton, uh, linen, silk, they decompose in less than a year. So we are not contributing to a landfill. You'll uh, see also our mood boards. We go into creating this whole dream of like, where's my woman going? What is she doing? Like, what am I making her dream of, right? And what am I bringing uh, uh, through color, through movement, through draping? My strength is my draping. Uh, so I do a lot of it in my dress form. Some sketches start with just a draping and some start by just sketching. I have like about, I don't know, more than 50 uh, sketches because I'm very, I love the process of seeing how I'm advancing. My line is for everyone, but it has a touch of South American romance. I think it's emotional connection. When I am designing my pieces is like, who am I honoring? Who am I thinking about this garment that I'm creating? I always think of my mom. She's always in the back of like, uh, just to see her uh, spirit of how a fighter she was uh, for us growing up. And she was always just so well-dressed and giving you this perspective and a joyful appearance. I think that's what I do. What I do is you know, I'm celebrating women's uh, journeys and women's curves. My brand is sold uh, specifically online at cindycastro.com. We are at one retailer, online retailer, and it's just online for now. I want to bring awareness of how everything is done behind the scenes. And I'm taking that very close because the people that make me feel home when I just moved here, were the people working in the sample rooms, which the majority are immigrants. So I want to give back and I want to create a place where they can see themselves growing and not only a job that they're doing for the rest of their lives and where their dreams die. I think seeing that lack of you know, representation during the years that I was in the industry, seeing the lack of leadership of Latinas, I wanted people to see us so we can also be at the forefront, that we can also be inspiring and that we are creatives and that we can be innovative. And that's why my goal is to be one of the first leading Latinas in sustainability. What does it mean to be Latinx in America today? And what is the best support needed for that community? This long-standing member of a Brooklyn-based nonprofit discusses his outreach efforts and how his Mexican heritage and CUNY education gave him the tools needed to support his community. Our Latin community is very hardworking. Sometimes they are working uh, eight, 10, 12 hours a day, it becomes really complicated to get home and start applying for a certain service. While if they just come here, they usually get it as, as soon as probably that day. Hi, my name is Marcelino Martinez and I'm the finance manager at Mexico Organization. I'm originally from Mexico City and I've been living in the US for 18 years. There's always that responsibility of having to decide at a very young age to know exactly what you want to do the rest of your life. So I didn't know what to study and my mom wanted me to come here and I eventually did. And I said I was gonna stay for a year and I actually ended up staying a little longer than that. After that, I decided to go to college. I initially went to BMCC and I took a, an accounting course that I actually enjoyed it and I decided to study something related to finance and then eventually transferred to Baruch. CUNY Becas at the time was providing some scholarships. I was a recipient of that scholarship and that required us to complete 200 hours at a nonprofit. And because I was very familiar with Mixteca, I decided to do my hours here. I was an intern and 
the same time, I wasn't doing anything related to accounting, but I was just participating. Uh, and that's how I put my foot in. I actually later joined a cooperative called Ready New York City, which was developed by the Democracy Work Institute. The whole idea was to provide services to nonprofit organizations. I was in the focus group and they were asking some of members of the focus group some of the services that they would need. And definitely accounting was one of them. Then it goes from interpretation, translation, accounting services, IT services. At that time it was Jose Higuera and Marlene Hernandez from uh, it's the, study, the Mexican Studies Institute at Lehman supported us and it was a great experience overall. It really exposed me to other cooperatives and I started to get clients through that. And actually at the launch event, that's when I met the current executive director at Mixteca and I eventually ended up working at, at this nonprofit. Mixteca has four main cores. That's adult education, immigrant rights, mental health, and health services. In 2000, the Latino community were getting the HIV virus, and there was not that much information available. And I think it was Dr. Rincon who initiated the nonprofit, and through that is that it was offering these outreach services, and it actually made a difference. And then some years later, some other um, services were incorporated. So right now it's mainly providing services to the uh, Latino community and not just them because at this point we see people from different other countries coming to Mixteca and from different boroughs. My role right now is more on the administrative side but they does a key role because when it comes to applying for new grants we need to see what services we can provide, where is it that we need more funds available when the census was happening, uh, Mixteca applied for grants because there was a need for the census, for people to participate in the census. So we were able to pull some funds to do outreach. Then the pandemic happened and we applied for, uh, to have a food pantry. And so we started to get funds for that. Right now, a lot of community members don't have a health insurance. There's the NYC care program and Right now the organization is helping them uh, fill the forms them to apply for this and most of them definitely get it. The mental health team has actually grown and in the case of workforce development, Mixtec is offering OSHA trainings for free. So all of the services are provided uh, for free. I can tell you from my perspective of my community, immigrant community, I think it's the assumption that everyone should know technology and that everyone's tech savvy, but not really. A lot of uh, community members started using a computer for the first time and we help them through that process. And some of them don't speak English, so we'll help them uh, navigate the system. And it's not just Spanish, there are some other um, native languages that, you know, if, if you don't speak Spanish or if you don't speak English, then it becomes really complicated. I think the long term goal is for Mixteca to be present in different boroughs, not just Brooklyn, but also the Bronx and Queens. Hopefully that happens, and I think the first step is, is already there. Coming from Valencia, Spain, our next guest is proof of how creativity and talent are enhanced by combining experiences from two different cultures. My name is Elena del Rivero. I was born in Valencia, Spain. I am in New York since 1988, and I became a citizen in 2003. To be an immigrant in this country really transformed me. Coming from Europe, from the old world, from Spain, it was very different. It is true that I was brought up under Franco regime, and I cannot compare it because this country has very good things to welcome creativity, to welcome ideas and the possibility of doing things always. I'm working with materials that at first sight look 
unusable. I collect things from the street. People give me things that they don't use anymore. With them, I conform assemblages that I think are important for me and for the art world and for the political scene today because they deal with the fragility of life and composing works of art out of destruction. That is important for me right now. After 9-11, when my studio was partially destroyed, out of the blue, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life anymore. When I was able to return to the studio two months after September 11th, I saw the destruction around me, and it was an important moment. But I knew also at that precise moment that there was something for me to do and to recuperate somehow. With the passage of time, I started different projects around 9-11. All of them conformed the archive of dust. I photographed my destroyed works. Out of them, I made my photo collages. I printed the photographs, and then I literally destroyed them and put them back together again with a stitching. Dust, a flask filled with the actual dust from 9-11. It's all sealed. There is another important piece, dust, which is video, where I am raking the dust with my hands, the same way that I saw the workers on the pit raking the dust to find objects and remains. My most important work is shunt, made out of 3,150 pieces of paper that had flown from Tower South onto the floors of my studio. Art is not to entertain. Art is to make people think. What it is not helping is that we are promoting the idea that to be a good artist, you have to be famous and wealthy. And that is the opposite of what the role of the artist has been. I think um, artists, you know, represent the moment where they live and they have to be a mirror of society. I'm thinking now of Goya, the great Spanish artist that did all the greatest work, that all the bourgeois at that time were buying his work, all the princes, all the duchesses in the world. When he started to depict society, decadent as it was, all the support vanished, having to flee to Bordeaux in the south of France. And there is where he did the most outrageous work, the black paintings. That is to say that the artist has a task in society. The first big project that I did with the dish towels was for the drawing center. They were made on paper. From paper, I went to canvas and then with acrylics. The dish towels for me are one, the most humble item in the household. They represent the kitchen, the political place by excellence. Why? Because it is at the kitchen table that we resolve problems concerning the household with our children. On the other hand, the kitchen, which for years was the greed, the prison for women, and at the same time, their liberation. The prison because they had to be in the kitchen. Liberation because there they did what they wanted. It was the only place for them to be free. And I applied for a Guggenheim with my dish towels as flags to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution that gave the vote to women. I got the Guggenheim, by the way, with my project. And now I'm trying to finish the project. I need nine more venues because the project was 19th venues for the 19th Amendment. 
For me, it was a challenge to elevate that humble item in the household to the great art. That's our show. If you want to know more about the guests we featured, check out our Instagram page at Shades of Us TV and online at tv.cuny.edu. You can now download the app and watch CUNY TV from wherever you are. I'm Daryl Brown. See you next time on Shades of Us.